So uh, let's just you know step back a little bit. I noticed you have the FTIR sitting behind you. You know that's a small uh, uh, FTIR. You know IS yep. five, I guess. You know from Thermo Fisher. Yeah. And uh, you know, obviously, this is different than FDIR microscope. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about, you know, you get your sample into your lab. What does the typical workflow look like for you? You know, what do you right. use this FDIR I-5 for? So um, our workflow, you know, uh, what I'm showing you today is certainly not microplastics workflow. This is um, for our mesoplastics and our megaplastics workflow. So we've gone out onto a beach. Let's say we're monitoring the effectiveness of a single-use plastic ban of a particular kind. Um, for instance, Maui has an expanded polystyrene foam ban for all carry-out and take-out foods, whether it's from a grocery store, a food truck, or a restaurant. And so um, we tracked the uh, amount of expanded polystyrene foam in the beaches before and after the ban took place to see if it made um, any difference at all. And what I'm showing you here are plastic pieces that were collected um, from Kailua Beach. And these are incredibly common. So, you know, this would take maybe five minutes or less to collect these pieces. Um, and this piece is an oyster spacer. So it's used in the aquaculture of um, oysters in Asia and um, the West Coast of America. And so they are mostly polyethylene and polypropylene, which means they float on the surface of the water and they become uh, plastic marine debris washing ashore in Hawaii. Um, so we first come into the lab and we lay out all the pieces and we get photographs of them. We size them mostly with just using a ruler and very quickly um, tallying the sizes of the pieces. We note the color. We also have a, um, a weathering index that we've named the Brignac Weathering Index. Kayla Brignac is our lab manager and was a past student, um, a graduated student that um, came up with this idea of uh, looking at the surface weathering of a piece and looking for square fracturing. And if it's severe square fracturing, which this one is, it would get a code three. And if it's a fairly fresh piece, uh, this is not fresh either. Um, I don't think I have a fresh piece. Oh, well, yeah, the zip tie is. So the zip tie still has quite a sheen and no square fracturing at all. This would have a code one. So we make visual assessments of the weathering code. We note um, whether it is line. So this is some kind of um, fishing line or net or rope. Um, so we note the different categories and we typically use fragments, which is what this would be. Fragment, foam, sheet. Uh, if it's like a very thin film of plastic, so a plastic bag um, would be an example of a, a sheet. And then we also do line and pellets. We'll keep separate. We categorize those separately. And the other thing that we do kind of different than a lot of the other labs is we'll identify things as whole. And so this would not be a fragment. This is a whole thing. And then we describe what that thing is. And this is some kind of bottle cap. And so we note that. And here's a cigarette filter. Those are very common on our beaches as well. So then once we have them um, categorized, and we do all of this in um, Google Sheets so that we can have multiple trays of samples going at different stages on one single project. We don't want to get bogged down with having to hand write data because we're categorizing thousands of samples in every project. And we have a team of maybe 20 volunteer students working on any project at any time, and they're in different places, and some of them are weighing them. So that's the next step is that we'd be weighing them while another tray is being categorized and photographed. And so we use co uh, collaborative online um, data collection 
software so that we don't have to all be in the same place at the same time and transposing numbers while we type them all in. So um, it, the data is collected in real time that way. Uh, so the next thing we would do is weigh each one of these pieces and then put them on the FTIR. And um, over here, I did put one on earlier and I, I didn't want to remove it because I wanted you to see what happened to it because I wasn't sure if we could recreate it again. Um, so this was a fragment of white plastic. And as I tightened this down, it just shattered. And so when that happens, it does fortunately leave a little bit of the powder underneath um, the, the force gauge and um, it still was able to collect a really nice spectrum. Um, my computer has gone to sleep and I'm gonna have to log in, to pull that up. But it was polyethylene, um, which is, about 70% of the samples that we analyze is polyethylene. And we, um, yeah. okay, here's the spectrum. Kind of weird showing you a spectrum on one computer to the next computer. <laughs> <laughs> My hair is stuck in it. Um, so very, very uh, common polyethylene spectrum and we don't even search each piece. We don't search each piece through the library um, because that would take extra time. So in our Google Sheet, we just type in polyethylene. We've trained our eyes to look for particular um, peaks. We're not going to look for itty bitty tiny peaks and we're not going to dive into every single spectrum in detail. If there's one that pops up that's noisy, we'll rerun the sample. If one that pops up as unknown, our eyes cannot figure out what it is from the top 10 common polymers that we've trained our eyes to see, then we will run it through a library and try to figure it out um, in more detail. So that is our common laboratory uh, workflow. Of course, then we have all the data analysis to do, um, which is taking that spreadsheet that has maybe 10,000 pieces, uh, 10,000 rows of lots of information and pulling that together into pie charts of different colors, different polymers, different um, items of whole things to try to get at what, what are the sources of this debris. Okay. Well, it looks like this is a workhorse, right? For especially for the you know the the mega particles, the meso particles you are, you are talking about. Maybe uh, uh, so when would you decide, or, or what kind of a sample you then decide? Say I'm going to use in the you know my FTIR microscope to do that. You know what kind of is that come from a sediment or, or from water? What type of sample? Right. Yeah, um, we have so many different projects in the queue ready to use that microscope FTIR and now we can't get access to it because we're not allowed to go into the lab. It's um, really infuriating because thank you so much for sharing this instrument on a temporary loan through a seed unit agreement with Hawaii Pacific University. Um, as you said, Thermo Fisher does seem to be um, very engaged in this community and you have instruments that I believe are going to be um, really promising and useful for this field. So once we get back into the lab, the kind of samples that we will put on the microscope FTIR are, um, we have been working on a Hawaiian beach sand microplastic study. We would like to do more um, fish and sea turtle and seabird gut analysis at the micro level because most everything we've done so far has been something that would be larger than one millimeter. So some of those pieces are microplastic, right? Some are one to five millimeters in size, but what we're really 
spending our effort looking for are things that are in the meso size, like quarter size is what we're seeing. Um, so they detract our attention, but now we want to look at the microplastic size range. Um, so we have proposals in right now trying to get funding to look at um, fish stomachs. We have a proposal in to look at sediment cores and microplastics in sediment cores, especially through the depth of that core can then tell you when were microplastics beginning to be laid down. So with radiocarbon dating, we can match each layer of the sediment core up to the date that um, we know that sediment was laid down. So we can look, you know, back in time using the sediment cores. Um, so those are the top three studies. Oh, um, JRC is running a drinking water inner laboratory study, and the samples are sitting in my refrigerator awaiting me to come back in. And I'll, that's the first study that I'll use the um, IN10MX for, is uh, they've provided drinking water with a microplastic um, standard. I'll be adding that into the drinking water that they provided, mixing that up, and then trying to separate those plastics out and then analyzing them um, on the microscope FTIR through chemical imaging mapping on the filter. Um, so that's the first sample that will be going through it. The second sample that will be going through it is a project that we've been doing up at James Campbell National Wildlife Refuge looking at Hawaiian beach sand. Um, at that place where there are no people, but lines and lines of trash wash in every day. And if you look at the sand, you can see the little microplastic particles. Um, our preliminary data says that the Hawaiian Islands beach microplastic um, pollution is the worst in the world. So we are, I think, going to hold a record that Hawaii doesn't want to hold, unfortunately. Um, but to prove that, we really need this kind of microscope FTIR tool to show that, yes, indeed, those particles are microplastics and not beach sand, right? When you get down to the um, 250 micrometer, our eyes are not very good at picking out the plastics from the sand. If they're one millimeter or bigger, our eyes are pretty good at that but we need the microscope FTIR to confirm what our eyes are believing that we're seeing. Um, and so that we can get the chemical composition of those particles. So we've taken um, Hawaiian beach sand. I'd love to tell you about that project just a little bit. Um, it's a project that was spearheaded by our undergraduate student, Ray Ivazian. He's an undergrad actually over at University of Hawaii but our research center is at Hawaii Pacific University. We open our doors to um, students from any university. Come on over. Um, we, we don't want to have walls and barriers on this. We want the brightest, most interested, passionate minds come on in. And he uh, developed, he engineered a buoyancy separator device. So it's a wheelbarrow with a um, recirculating pump. So he put seawater into the wheelbarrow with um, a tray of the beach sand in it, and it floats the plastic up out of the sand and pours over the side of the tray into the wheelbarrow. Then we scoop that up using a bucket strainer of 25 micrometers, and then we take that floating material into the lab. And then we dry that, weigh that, Oh, sorry, there's a step before that. Uh, once we bring that back to the lab, he has designed um, the trash time machine, is what he's called it, the TTM. And basically, it's putting the floating material into a pot of water and pulling a vacuum, which pulls all the air bubbles out of the pores of the plastic and the plant material, both. And once you release the, the, the vacuum, the plant matter sinks to the bottom and the plastics remain floating at the top. Um, I had to see it to believe it. And once I did, I was just like, 
poof, brilliant. I mean, this is amazing. And Ray is a really special student. He's, um, he uh, is retired from the Marine Corps, and he was a combat engineer in the Marine Corps. So when you think about what a combat engineer does, it's kind of like MacGyver, right? They're in the trenches designing what they need right there in the moment to get a job done. Uh, high stakes, right? And so he found himself retired from the, the Marine Corps and sitting on the Hawaiian beaches, just shaking his head about what's happening in the trenches here. And he engineered a way to do this efficiently and um, to leave the plant matter back on the beach because we don't want to remove those nutrients from the beach. The beach, beach needs that for the ecosystem. Um, and, you know, he came along and then my scientific brain came along with like the microscope FTIR is exactly what we need to get this study done and prove it to the world that your engineered tool is working very well on Hawaiian beaches. And so we're in the middle of that study right now. We sieve the materials at, at eight different sizes. And so we're in the process of doing all the bigger piece, the bigger sizes right now by hand and this guy right here. Um, and then uh, once we go back to work, we'll be diving into the 500 micrometer, the 250 micrometer, the 125 micrometer, the 63 micrometer, and the 25 micrometer. So those five size classes are sitting there waiting to be analyzed. Yeah, no, we are definitely looking forward to seeing those uh, you know, exciting results. But this is a perfect segue for my next question. You mentioned this little device, this, you know, ingenious, you know, student invented, right? We all know, you know, the sample prep is such an important part, you know, yeah. especially considering the complexity of the matrices we're dealing with when it comes to a microplastic research. So, I mean, one can even argue that, you know, part of the reason we are, we are in the current state is because the lack of a standard operation protocol, if you will, in the field of research for things that are trivial as a reporting unit. There are differences all over the place. You know, I would like to, you know, hear your comments on that, you know, sample yeah. prep or standardized, you know, SOP, things like that. Yeah. Um, well, I think my answer is it's a very uh, double-edged sword. So part of my answer is I find it incredibly frustrating that none of us are using the exact same method. Uh, if we could use the same methods and standardize those methods, then we could easily, more easily compare concentrations and um, polymer composition across the world by combining these studies and doing meta-analysis. So when I did a meta-analysis on sea turtles in 2018 and the plastics they're ingesting, you can actually hear the frustration in my writing. I was like, this is insane. I can't do anything with these 130 papers because they all did something different. They can't be, they're like apples and oranges. And I tried to find the best way to turn them all into apples. Um, but a lot of assumptions went into doing that. And so um, that's my, I'm very frustrated by this. But then there's the other side, which is when I step into my lab and I think about the methods that I, that might be the best, most optimal method, I don't think we've found it yet. That's the problem, is that we are all tinkering and still trying to find what is the best method for separating plastics out of digesta? What is the best method for separating plastics out of sediment or sand? And um, I think it's really common, and I definitely fall into this category too, for a scientist to look around the shelves of your lab and you say, oh, I have this chemical on the shelf. I'm going to use this because it's right here and I can use it right now and it costs me nothing extra, right? But maybe that chemical isn't the most optimal. And then that publication goes out and then other labs start to replicate that and maybe it's not the optimal method, right? 
And then there's um, the step back. And I'm trying to take that step back and look at what everyone's doing, try to find the more optimal thing in my lab first to see it and believe it, right? I, I'm a scientist. Yeah. I'm skeptical until I do that. And, um, you know, my lab is pr pretty new, so I haven't had a ton of experience doing this yet. But one thing that we have been doing um, through a master's student project with her name is Jenna Carr. She's been um, taking the different methods that labs have published that have tried to separate plastics away from biological tissue. So digest, uh, you know, the, the guts of, a, of an animal. and all she's doing is taking the common 13 polymers that we find in Hawaii that we are wanting to look at um, in our samples. She's taking those native standards, just plastic polymer. She's putting them into the chemicals that the scientists have been using. And there is not a single method that has been published so far that does not destroy one of those 13 polymers. So, that tells me we're not yet at a place where we can assign an optimal standardized method. We're not there yet. While we all want it very badly, we still have a lot of work to do. And our number one problem of um, getting there is funding. Yeah. So. Yes. Okay. Well, that's uh, you know a really important perspective, right? I mean, you talk about such a global effort and, and yet yeah, you know uh, everybody is still looking for the funding from the federal government or state government or what have you so that's going to be a you know it's going to be an ongoing issue we'll be dealing with yeah i know but I, just like you I, i'm optimistic I, I think the issue is indisputable I mean, there's a lot of attention from the scientific community at large you know we are doing a lot of great work you know scientists like yourself your group you know you guys are you know making a, a difference right i mean so we can you know, I, I believe there's a will, there's a way. I mean, it's a matter of, you know, there's solid science behind it. So I think that's all the question I had. Well, and I, I have only gotten wonderful, wonder, I only have wonderful words to say about Thermo Fisher and all the people that we um, have collaborated with and worked with so far. It seems you all are um, genuinely interested, genuinely care, and are making a difference in um, a scientific field that is new and struggling to get started. And so, um, yeah, this has been fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, looking forward to talking to you when you get some, uh, you know, when we're back to normal, get some concrete data, you know, we'll be happy to talk to you again. Absolutely. I can't wait for that, too. <laughs> <laughs>